right. Um, 24 minutes before 11 o'clock. Nice looking Monday. You've heard the term, um, if it doesn't kill you, it'll make you stronger, right? You've heard that yes. term before, right? Oh, I have. And, uh, you know, a lot of times we, we seem to believe that in this lifetime, and uh, I'm not questioning it or even doubting it. In fact, I agree with it, that I think a lot of times the adversities we go through are on the other side of adversity once we get through it, that we are better as people, we are stronger, we are more... Um, we are wiser. Maybe that's the maybe that's the word. And, and I'm not trying to tell you I know the meaning of life, but I just often wonder if that's not part of it. If if it's not part of life's experience, because it doesn't seem to spare anybody, rich, poor, whatever race you're in, uh, mm-hmm. you know, whatever either sex. It seems like we all have adversity, and. Um, in, in the news lately, you've heard of a lot of women who've been abused by men sexually, uh, and and the women kept it to themselves, and that's the, kind of the new thing is is letting out, letting other people know, hey, you know, this person abused me all those years ago, and so that that's a question I have too is when something. When we go through adversity and then we share it with everybody, you know, whether it was a, a fire or something that's not so. Has no, no emotional baggage, I guess, is the best way to say that. You, you're you're willing and free to to say, I was in a car accident, I was in a fire, I lost somebody I loved, uh, that kind of thing. You you have no problem telling others, but you might want to hold back, right? If somebody sexually uh, was inappropriate to you or worse mm-hmm. than that. Um, so I don't know which makes us stronger, uh, telling others about our adversities or holding them in. Dr. Meg J might know she's written a whole book about some of these topics. Uh, Supernormal is the title of the book, The Untold Story of Adversity and Resilience. Dr. Meg J is a clinical psychologist and associate, uh, associate professor of education at the University of Virginia, a contributor to the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, USA Today, Psychology Today, uh, NPR, BBC, and again, her book is called Supernormal. If you're looking at the podcast, that's the cover on the on the podcast. So let's say hello to Dr. Meg Jay and find out about this study. Good morning, doctor. Good morning, Larry. How are you? I'm good. Where are you calling from? I am in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia. All right. So am I right with this, that we, there are some people with so-called charmed lives, but none of us get through this life without some kind of adversity. Is that fair to say? I think that is probably correct, that um, actually 75% of us will experience some significant adversity, at, at least by the age of 20, and that can range from you know, alcoholism or substance abuse in the home or bullying in schools or an abusive coach or um, having a parent in jail. So if you look at all, if you look at the most common adversities and put them in one category, then it's 75% of us by the age of 20 have grown up with something. If, if, if adversity is caused by another person, somebody who violates us, um, is it reciprocated? Does the violator have some kind of adversity because of his or her behavior? Um, I'm not sure I'm following your question, Larry. You mean, does it... I I guess... The person who received it repeated, or... Okay, uh, okay, let me... Yeah, I I can see why it was hard to understand. Um, Okay, if, if I were to violate somebody... Um, the the punishment, and I was caught or, or turned in or whatever, and I went to trial, and then go, and then I went to prison. Okay, then that was there's okay. there's my adverse. The, um, I'm sorry. What's, what what's right? That? There, there's mine. That's my mm-hmm. right, right, that, right. That's now now I have to pay the piper, so to speak, because of what I did. But do, does it happen? I, I guess I'm asking so, sort of a I don't know supernatural kind of a question. But I mean, does karma exist in, in the real world, or or does it have to be brought to the courtroom in order for it to happen? Mm-hmm. Uh, gosh, you're beyond my realm of expertise with karma there. Uh, but, you know, we do know that most 
of the adversities that people say you were mentioning a fire or a car accident and you're right those are one one time one day you know no shame no blame not that they're easy adversities but they're a bit easier to talk about or even to heal from because it's it's not so difficult to share those but chronic adversities you know many people who grow up with an abusive parent or you know alcoholism Uh, um, it's not a one-time thing it's day after day year after year um, and it it really affects us down to a cellular level for life. And I'm not sure that, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that many people feel that the perpetrators out there are sort of, um, that life is fair, let me put it that way. But I guess there's not much we can do about that. And uh, you have uh, in your book written about ordinary everyday people that really seem to come to the rescue it's not the stars that are constantly in the limelight but people that you see and work with and go to school with every day yes yes and uh so the book is about adversity and resilience and 75 percent of us at least have a significant adversity and many 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 people find their way through it. They adapt well after adversity, which is what resilience is. And most of those people are hiding in plain sight as teachers and doctors and artists and entrepreneurs and maybe as radio personalities. Mm -hmm. Um, And so in the book, I talk some about famous people from, you know, Oprah Winfrey to Viola Davis and uh, Andre Agassi or Howard Schultz. But just to show that, you know, for people out there struggling, you're in good company. You're not the only, you know, you're not alone with us. You don't have to be doomed. But, you know, many people who overcome adversity, they're everyday people, and we don't even know how heroic they've been. Is it important to let others know? Okay, if I went through any adversity, I would be reluctant to talk about it, only because mine, I, I think, would pale compared to others like if i said oh my gosh here's my hard times i went through i had a flat tire on the turnpike okay that's nothing compared so i you know what i mean i'm using that as an example but right right. but but does do we psychologically speaking benefit from letting it go use okay uh, the better example instead of my stupid turnpike thing is is the the ladies right now that are coming at the Me Too movement? Are they mm-hmm. right, are right. they starting a healing process for themselves by mentioning it? Yes, so absolutely, that people do benefit from talking about their adversities, and talking about has different degrees of publicness. So you know, me, you know, putting Me Too on Twitter is a very public way of saying, "Hey, I've been through something too," and that helps people feel less alone, and that's been a very positive thing. Um, But you can also, if you're not comfortable going public with your adversity, you can go private and tell at least one other person, whether that's a friend or a partner or a doctor or a teacher. But we do know that just talking about your experiences, your adversities, um, is truly healing for the brain and the body. It reduces stress. And it helps people feel less isolated um, because they're able to be seen by another person. And you talk about the bad times that seemed, even though they're, they don't happen all the time, that they seem to overshadow all of the good times when you're growing up in a family. Yes, and that's an interesting thing about our brains. So our brains are wired to keep us alive and not happy. So what that means is that um, we tend to pay special attention to the dangerous things, the the bad people, the not-so-great experiences, because our survival depends on that. And so it takes a lot of work, and usually that's what people are working on in, in adulthood after a childhood of stress or of danger is trying to help the good um, be as big in their minds and in their hearts as the bad because we're wired to pay special attention to bad memories. So since this is so hmm. destructive, why then do some women go for the bad boys? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I think sometimes people, it's hard to imagine Um, having what they haven't seen or, you know, having a better life than the one that they grew up with as kids or having a, you know, having a partner that doesn't have the problems that maybe their parents had. And I think it's less about 
this, you know, I need to repeat the past as much as people not imagine. I mean, it takes a lot of courage to say, I'm going to grow up and I'm, I'm going to do marriage or partnership or parenting better than my own family. And it takes a lot of courage to imagine that you can do that, but so many people do. So tell me about the book, Supernormal is the title. Uh, if you're just tuning in, Dr. Meg J is our guest, and she wrote the book, Supernormal, The Untold Story of Adversity and Resilience. So did you, th- is the book filled with um, different people that, that you t- um, give us their stories? Yes, it's, uh, it's actually, it, it has about a dozen of the most common adversities that people grow up with, whether it's, you know, like I said, alcoholism or sexual abuse or domestic violence in the home or bullying, because too often those conversations take place in, in silos and in little groups, and people feel very isolated from other people because of their adversity. But really, it's one big conversation. And so it looks at a wide range of people from a wide range of backgrounds with a wide range of adversities to say, none of you are as alone um, as you think in this um, endeavor to overcome, you know, what you've lived with early on. And so it takes Mm -hmm. you through those people's stories, but also the science behind what's happening as they try to be resilient. So when you're talking about the neuroscience part of this, when a person goes to a therapist, is that therapist most likely to just try to treat you on a non-medicated level, or are they prone to offer medication to try to get into parts of the brain to help them um, you know, either either of those. I mean, the, the different people need different interventions. But um, and you know, you don't even you don't need to go to a therapist to be resilient. I mean, this is not a the prescription is go get a therapist. I mean, the, the book shows that you know many people take different paths. But um, sure, medications help some people, but many people are helped, like we were just talking about, just by talking about what their experiences have been and making sense of those experiences, understanding what they went through as an adversity. Like you said, many people who, you know, they'll say, well, I haven't been in a war, you know, having an alcoholic for a parent, that's not a real adversity. Um, But then of course, realizing that it is can help people understand, you know, how it's had such a big, big impact or why it's been so difficult to overcome and that's usually the beginning of doing it differently as an adult than it was done for you just as a way to ask a question i'm going to ask everybody to just imagine there is such a thing as an alternate universe so let's say there's an alternate universe and in this universe somebody is let's say there's two alternate universes so in in this universe somebody is abused and then after the abuse, they either become also an abuser or somebody who's so defiant about abuse that he or she um, becomes almost like a, a, a soldier against abuse. It, it, became, it becomes a real motivating part of their life. And in, 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 the, right. in, in the alternate universe, that same person has never been abused. Would... Would the abuse have made that person more passionate, I guess, about being an an, an advocate for, for right. non abuse? You know what I mean? It's well, I, I'm right. I'm I thinking think it, it helps yeah. it helps us choose a direction in our lives. Not that it's a good yeah. thing. Exactly. You you really summed it up. So there's actually a great parable that a minister shared with me about two boys that grow up in a home with an abusive alcoholic as a dad, and one becomes a, a you know a violent man and an alcoholic, and the other becomes an abstinent man and a model parent. And the minister asked both of them, you know, how do you think you became who you are? And they both said the same thing. They both said, hmm. given who my father was, how could I not? And so what that shows is that, you know, two people who go through the same circumstances can take different paths. And the path you're talking about are people who feel really driven 
to help people the way they wish they'd been helped or be the parent they wish they'd had or create the community they wish they'd lived in. And then you will hear those people from, and you can hear them in the public life from Elizabeth Smart to Oprah Winfrey, you know, saying, I wouldn't wish what I went through on anyone. However, given that it happened to me and I can't undo it, I can see how it's made me a more um, impassioned or a more determined or a more courageous person um, who feels an obligation to go out and do good in the world. When uh, people are self-analyzing their own selves, uh, do they sort of equate that feeling with the superhero characters that they've grown up with? Because each superhero character has some form of loneliness or something like that going on. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, so that's the metaphor that I use in Supernormal and has something to do with the title there. And um, was what I learned from listening to people of all walks of life with all sorts of adversities is that when I would ask people, do you see yourself as resilient, they would all say no. And I thought that was interesting. And what I learned from them was that, in general, we talk about resilience too simplistically, we say people who are resilient, they bounce back or they rebound, but overcoming adversity is nothing like that. And what I did find out, they, not everyone, but many of my clients identified with these sort of superheroic or heroic characters who, if you think about superheroes, they all have their origin story. Something happened that put them on a path to where they were, you know, dodging bullets and leaping over buildings all day. Um... And, like we just talked about, that thing often led them to kind of grow up and decide to go out and do some good in the world. Um, you know, the, the downside being that, you know, many superheroes are so busy sort of trying to save themselves and save others, they often don't have time for a personal life, which can be the last struggle or the last battle. Um, you know, and resilience is how do I not just survive, but really thrive um, as yeah. a person. The one of the stories in the book is about uh, a young lady named Nadia who uh, did not know that her parents had been killed in, in a robbery, and right. uh, and she found out from voicemails that that had happened. And one of the things I thought about in that one was the the friend of the person who went through the adversity. I put myself in that person's uh -huh. shoes. Like, do I forevermore? feel sorry or do i say okay it's been a year you should be over it by now i i don't know you know what i mean there's no way i would right. know how that person would feel and therefore i don't know how i would unless i was if it was super close then i think i would have no clue i mean i would have i would definitely have no problem i would know but if it was somebody i worked right. with for example i would have a hard time right yeah and those are often the sort of the two ends of the spectrum um the gosh you know people won't stop pitying me and i, I just want to be treated like a normal person mm. however you know we do also say you know i think too prematurely aren't you over this by now and so you know i think yeah, it's, yeah. it's a bit of both of recognizing that you know it adversities are, are always, I mean, it's always going to be sad that you've lost your parents, or it's always going to be sad that you, you know, grew up with a parent in jail, it, um, or it's always going to be hard, let's put it that way, and to recognize that it doesn't, there's not this period where, you know, okay, you're over it now, yet at the same time, I think one reason people do keep such things to themselves as they kind of get tired of being seen through that lens. Yeah. Have you because found they these? Be that. They just want to be themselves. Have you have you found these uh, personalities in different cultures throughout the world, or did you just focus on the people within the United States? Um, you know, I'm just talking, telling the stories of my clients who you know cut across race, class, gender, but they're all. U.S., maybe not U.S. born, but they're living here now, but their research around how common adversity is um, and what chronic stress does to you over time, that that's, that's been, you know, established around the world. Do you, is there such a thing as a vicarious adversity? In other words, when you hear a story about, for example, Vegas, where the guy's shooting out the window and 50-something people are now dead and, and, and hundreds more traumatized by that experience. Right. 
So the rest of us sure. watched it on news, and that morning we hear the news, right. and we're all glued to the radio and the TV, and we're, we're traumatized in a remote way. Mm-hmm. But right. tomorrow we're on with our lives. We're having our Thanksgiving <laughs> dinner, you know. But but those sure. fa- those yeah. families they, those families last Thursday they had a horrible Thanksgiving. Those families, I'm sure. Right, absolutely. I mean, yes, that there is. I mean, it it is there is vicarious trauma, and you're right that it's often not doesn't have as much of an impact as direct trauma. But right now, you know, a lot of people are talking about just how unpredictable the world feels. And there's sort of bad news all the time, whether it's hurricanes or politics or sexual assault. I mean, it just seems like there's something different every day. And that, you know, even if it's not affecting you directly, we do all have to find ways to take a break from some of that so that you don't feel overwhelmed. I mean, it is a little bit like like having a, a, you know, alcoholism in the home where every day it's something, you know. Uh, and um, that's hard. Doctor, I want to ask you about the person walking through the bookstore or listening to this interview and deciding whether to buy the book or not. Um, I'm thinking there's two people that will. Um, the person who has gone through adversity and just wants to understand themselves better, that person, and then the person who's right. the friend of that person. I, I'm thinking mm-hmm. in both cases right. that those people would pick up the book. W- will it give them the tools to perhaps move on or, or to breathe a little bit easier? Yes. I mean, that was really the, the motivation behind the book was for people to feel understood and for people to understand. So to understand what they've been through and to see how it is that other people have managed to get to the other side of adversity. And I, and I make very, this is not a one day or one year project mm-hmm. for most people. I mean, you see that these are stories that go on, you know, they really span childhood or teen years, you know, up to or through middle adulthood, this, you know, quest to move from adversity to resilience. And I think it helps people to see that this is not a a quick fix. So do you encourage people to lighten up a a little bit and not take everything so seriously? What do you mean? Uh, I mean that, you know, sometimes people can be feeling down and then they go to get help for whatever it is that ails them and sometimes they lose their sense of humor or able to see the beauty and maybe a child laughing or something like that Mm. well that's tough i mean i think for people who are clinically depressed you i mean that's part of it you you can't see the positive that it, there's really like an absence of, of positive feeling and no matter how much they may want to it's just very difficult to do mm-hmm. but I think one thing we can all do you know especially at the holiday season and talking about how the brain is wired to pay more attention to, to bad memories is we can all feel better about our situation whatever it is by I don't just mean look on the bright side at all because some situations don't have bright sides, Mm -hmm. but to remember to pay attention to who are the good people who have helped us in these very difficult times, Um, you know, who was that teacher, that friend, you know, that partner who's helped us along the way, along the way, and to remember the good times and not just the bad ones. Dr. Meg J is our guest. Dr. Congratulations. The book on Amazon is getting good reviews, great reviews. Uh, The book is number one in the grief and bereavement department uh, category. And by the way, number four in the Kindle edition in the same category. And you have the number seven slot in the audiobook category. Nice. (laughs) Your book is one, four, (laughs) and seven on Amazon right now. Uh, I have a copy of the book. If you want it, call me. I'll I'll give it to you. Uh, The rest of us have to go buy it. I found it on Amazon. So the last question is this doctor where would you suggest we go do you have a website of your own i do it's uh it's just megj.com m-e-g-j-a-y.com but the book can be found at really any independent amazon barnes and noble itunes everywhere so um or the library if you have a library there you go that's Um, that's always a good one too all right uh thank you doctor for being on the air with us have a great holiday season thank you for putting so much work into this book i know this was a big one for you Thank you. I really appreciate that. I want to help people, so I hope it does. I think so. I think that's exactly what it's going to do. We'll take a break. Be right back.
Broadcasting from the Paddock Mall Studios, this is WOCA, Ocala, Gainesville, The Villages, 1370 AM, 96.3 FM, The Source. If you find an animal or a bird that needs help, call Animus Foundation at 352-843-6379. They will come and get the animal if you can't take it to them. High school students and those with court-ordered community service can earn required hours in this rewarding environment. And veterans who share a bond with animals and parrots who have been through mental or physical trauma are especially welcomed. Families, clubs, and tourists can arrange for tours of Animus without driving for hours or miles. Consider volunteering. Animus needs you. Are you ready for some super terrific Christmas gifting ideas from Bob Wine's Camellia Gardens in Ocala? Just take a listen. The poinsettias have arrived, and even though they're in short supply this year, Bob still rolls back the price. Very nice, three to five bloom, four inch poinsettias. You get three for just $10.